Hey, good morning, everyone. I ask uh, people to take their seats, please. And it's nice to see so many people who uh, have returned from yesterday. And a welcome to those who are just no, uh, showing up this morning. Uh, those <coughs> whom I haven't met, my name is Tom Stegman. I'm the Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry. Uh, yesterday, we had a wonderful day, uh, two great sessions on uh, the Old Testament in uh, the Christian Bible and justice in the Bible, and then a very riveting and energetic keynote address uh, from Luke Johnson, uh, a great spirit. And the, my colleagues here have all commented on how impressed they are with, first of all, the interest and the energy in the audience, and also the uh, very thoughtful questions and comments. So. We hope to continue that uh, this morning. And we have two great sessions, uh, the first of which is prayer texts in the Bible. And it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, uh, Eileen Schuler, OSU. That does not stand for Ohio State University, incidentally. Uh, she's an Ursuline sister who grew up in Alberta, Canada. She's a graduate of the University of Toronto with a master's degree there and a PhD from Harvard University. Eileen taught at the Atlantic School of Theology in Nova Scotia for seven years prior to joining, joining the Department of Religious Studies at McMaster University in Ontario in 1990. She continues to teach there today as the Senator William McMaster Chair in the Study of Religion. Much of Eileen's scholarly career has centered around the Dead Sea Scrolls working to ensure their careful study, analysis, and publication, and helping people to understand both their content and their importance in the field of modern biblical research. She was part of the team of editors who published the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1990s, and she regularly writes and lectures on them around the world, focusing on the non-canonical psalms, on the Hodayot, the hymns of praise from the scrolls, and on women in the Bible. In 2014, Sister Schuler was elected to the Royal Society of Canada in recognition of her scholarship. And Pope Francis conferred on her the Pro Ecclesia at Pontifice for the Church and the Pope Medal for her distinguished leadership in the Catholic community. Pretty good stuff. <laughs> Eileen has been an editor and contributor to many publications in the field of biblical studies including the Harper Collins Study Bible and the New Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible. She just finished a very successful term as president of the Catholic Biblical Association and is the co-editor of the Paulist Biblical Commentary and the author of the article, The History of the Biblical Period II, in this commentary. And before bringing Eileen up, I also will uh, introduce uh, our respondent, who's our newest faculty member at the School of Theology and Ministry, uh, finishing his doctorate at Duke University. Matt Monig is instructor of New Testament at our school, and we're very happy to have him both at the school and here on this panel. Let's welcome Eileen. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, and I'm really very honored to be here today for this celebration and to share in the anniversary of the school here. This is a wonderful opportunity. My approach this morning is going to be a little bit different than the presentations that we heard yesterday and probably the one that's coming up later this morning. And perhaps the title hasn't given you fair warning but I hope that you'll bear with me if this is not exactly what you expected, and that you also might find something here of interest, of information, and even inspiration. When I was working on the Paulus Biblical Commentary, one of the books that I was, edit you know, was in charge of as editor then was the section on the Psalms, the Biblical Psalter that was written by Father John Andres and Sister Julia Prince. And as I was doing it, I often was reflecting, I found myself thinking about 
how their work on the book of Psalms related to what I had been doing on, over so many years in my own research on Jewish Psalms and prayers. And so when I talked to Father Stegerman about a diff number of different topics I could talk on today, he encouraged me to reflect a bit about, you know, on my, my own work and how this relates to the biblical Psalms. And so that's what I'm going to highlight this morning. So scholars who have studied the Psalms really since the 19th century have noted that they fit into a broader context. They have similarities to prayers and psalms that come from the surrounding cultures in Mesopotamia and Babylon, even going way back to the Sumerians, 2000 BC, and of course to the Egyptians. I mean, all of these ancient peoples had words of praise, lament, petition addressed to the deities. And you'll notice, for instance, in the Paulus Biblical Commentary, in the discussion of some of the Psalms, Psalm 19 and Psalm 104, for instance, Andres and Prince point out some very interesting links with, for instance, an Egyptian hymn to Aten, the sun god. And I think it's often when we know what was in common in the ancient Near East, what was sort of standard ways to praise, petition, lament, forms and patterns, vocabulary, that then we can appreciate what the biblical world and the world of the Psalms shared with the world around it, but also what is distinctive in them. It's only against that background that we can see what are some of the distinctive features. And this was certainly highlighted with the discovery then of texts from much closer, indeed overlapping, with the world of Jesus. So I'm coming now to the Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered in the caves of Qumran some 70 years ago. Everybody's heard of Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Yeah. So actually, you know, we're looking at 70 years. They were discovered between 1947 and 1956. And so we're really celebrating the 70th anniversary in many different conferences and venues around the world. So perhaps it's appropriate that we bring them in here too. Now this collection, and some would call it a library, of some 850 ancient manuscripts contained a surprisingly large number of copies of the Psalter. I'm gonna say more about that in a few minutes. But there's certainly many more copies of the books of Psalms than of Genesis or the rest of the Torah. Deuteronomy is the only book that comes close. There's more copies of the Psalms than any prophet. Isaiah you know, is the largest number of, psalm, of prophetic books. But even more than copies of the biblical Psalms, the Psalm manuscripts, what was surprising and really quite unexpected for scholars when they were reading these fragments for the first time, was that so many of them contained collections of prayers, rather short prayers in prose, prayers that were to be said on each day of the week because they have little rubrics, what in our liturgical books would be in red, you know, for Friday, for the day of Shabbat. Prayers for sunrise and sunset for each day of the month, and the cycle of prayers for the major festivals, Yom Kippur, Passover, and so on. And if we count them up, and we can count in slightly different ways, so you get a different figures given, but there's general agreement that there are probably at least 200 psalms and prayers coming from the first century BCE, the first century CE, so we're very close to the time of Jesus, and most of these were completely unknown to us before 1947. I say most of them because a couple of these psalms, for instance, what we call Psalm 151, shows up in the Greek Psalter, a psalm of David, where it's actually said, this goes beyond the, the number of 150. A couple show up in later Syriac translations, but now we have the original Hebrew. Now, if I can be 
a little bit autobiographical for a moment and reflect on my own experience about how and why I became involved in this study. Way back in 1977, when my community gave me the opportunity to embark on doctoral studies, I had to decide what area I was going to concentrate on. And I had been teaching at that time at a seminary in Edmonton, in Canada, and I was working for the diocese in liturgy. So this wasn't that long after Vatican II, the parishes were all implementing the reforms of Vatican II. And part of the council renewal of the liturgy was a looking back to our Jewish roots. And if you think for a moment, just think for instance of the prayer that was introduced in the mass that we say all the time at the offertory. You know, the priest says, blessed are you Lord God of all creation for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you. And blessed are you we have received the wine we offer you. And the people respond, blessed be God forever. I mean, this is a very Jewish style of prayer framed in this structural language of a blessing. You know, if you go to a synagogue here in Brooklyn, you'll find very much prayers framed in this same way. And so I became fascinated with the question, well, how would have Jesus prayed? What prayers would have he said? When he went to the temple, when he was in the synagogue, this seemed like a great topic for a dissertation. But like most or many doctoral students, I soon discovered that the question was much more complicated than it first appeared. When I came here to Boston, when I went to Harvard, my thesis advisor, John Strugnell, pointed out to me that it was not going to be so easy how much did we really know about what prayers were being used at the time of Jesus? Now, the Psalms certainly were being used, but in a certain sense, they're often linked very much, their home is very much in the temple. We think of the temple singers who sang the songs at the times of sacrifice. And the Psalter itself was often called the hymn book of the second temple. But apart from what we know about the temple and the priests, that priestly world, if you think about it, there's really no command in the Old Testament to pray daily, or how many times to pray, or much less what to say, especially if you're praying in a community, how to structure a prayer. Now, we could certainly look at how Jews pray today. And this was very common in these years, especially after the Vatican Council. Today, the Jewish communities around the world with small variations, but they have a real prayer book, a sidur, an order of prayers to be said three times a day. They're a mixture of biblical psalms and verses, but then long series of blessings where you bless it be God, Baruch Atah the Naimelech Olam, at the beginning, at the end. There are certain set formulas. But the earliest copies that have survived of the Sidur are from the 8th or 9th century, from the early Middle Ages. So the question is how much, how long, far back do these traditions go? How much can we retroject back to the first century and use this to imagine how Jesus prayed? Wouldn't it be better if we had texts from the first century? And of course, I, mean, this, I think in some ways this is a gift of providence. Uh, my own thesis advisor, John Strugnell, was one of the editors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he had been assigned some of the texts and psalm manuscripts. And in the 1980s, when I was starting my thesis, many of these were still not published. And so to make a long story short, I had my doctoral work cut out for me. I worked on a series of some manuscripts. And I've been one working then on editing and translating and trying to understand these texts now for almost 40 years. And there's still a lot to be done. 
So what I'm going to just reflect on for a few minutes now is how has this new material, in the sense newly discovered material, from the Dead Sea Scrolls enriched our study of prayer in the Bible? And I'm just, going, I'm just choosing four points, more by way of examples than anything else. You have a handout. We won't go through all these texts, but I thought maybe you'd want to take some of them home. You could look at them afterwards. We'll point out a few things. Does everybody have a hand? Yeah, thanks very much. <coughs> well, okay. hey, you. Great. Okay, we don't need it right at the beginning, so we'll get it here. The first thing that I would really like to emphasize is simply the simple fact that the one thing that we do know now in a way that we didn't know earlier is that there was a rich and ongoing tradition of composing new and continually composing psalms, poetic texts that were modeled on the biblical psalms but with distinctive features. So the composition of psalms did not come to an end when you got to Psalm 150, or even when a collection of 150 psalms was put together from a wider pool. Now I, I, emphasize, I mean, maybe this sounds obvious, but I emphasize it because what this points to is that there was a rich and vibrant pietistic tradition within Judaism at the period. I mean, certainly this was a time when there was also a deep and an ongoing concern with legal regulations, the development of halakha, of law, interpreting the laws of the Torah. And that's often, you know, what people know about Judaism at that time. But I think this is also the other side that we're seeing, the tradition of the Psalms, and that points us more to the spirituality that was part of Judaism at the time. Now, one of the major collections is this collection. I give you an example here, just really an example on your text. A collection of about 35 Thanksgiving Psalms, or the Hebrew name is Hodayot. They're often just called by that Hebrew name. But you can see they're very much modeled on the biblical Psalms of Thanksgiving. And this was clearly an important text. We have eight copies of it at Qumran, which is you know, a substantial number. The one that the fullest copy is written in a very elegant style on a large manuscript. Other copies are much smaller. They're almost like pocket editions that you know, were perhaps more, much, much more used for personal use. But you can see, I thank you, O Lord my God, that you have acted wonderfully. The standard in biblical songs, I thank you because you have acted wonderfully with dust and with a vessel of clay you have worked so very powerfully. What am I that you have instructed me in the secret counsel of your truth and have given me insight into your wonderful deeds that you have put thanksgiving in my mouth and praise upon my tongue. You know, continually I will bless your name, I will recount your glories. In your goodness is abundant forgiveness and in your compassion is for all the children of your good favor. For you have made known to them the secret counsel of your truth and given them insight into your wonderful <coughs> mysteries. So this is very much like the biblical thanksgiving psalms. You narrate what God has done. But there are distinctive elements here, much more reflection and much more didactic and this sense that God has revealed some secret mysteries, your counsel, your wonderful mysteries. So the particular worldview of this group of Jews that were writing these texts, whether these were exactly the Essenes that Josephus and Philo are describing or not is a big question of discussion, but they do seem to talk about a particular group or sect within Judaism that had its own worldview, its own theology, 
But I think what's interesting is one of the ways that that worldview is expressed then is through poetry addressed to God. I think, in particular, as some of you might know, the very important book of Carol Newsom at Emory, The Self as Symbolic Space, Constructing Identity in Qumran at Qumran. And she really moved the question from what do the Hodayot, the Thanksgiving Psalms, say, which is often how we approached both biblical and these texts, you know, as almost sources of dogma. What do they say? She said, no, maybe that's not the most important question. The question is, what do the Hodayot do? And for a, mem a person to choose to join this distinctive group with a very strong, almost harsh discipline at times, how did they become formed? How did they take on the distinctive worldview of this community? So this goes back to many things that actually Luke Johnson was talking about last night. You know, how do texts and poetic texts addressed to God in particular form self-identity and communal identity? We could, you know, we, I'm sure we'll talk more about that. But I think sometimes reading a text like the Hodayot, precisely because they're not canonical texts, and they're not the texts we have grown up with, they help us to ask those questions. And you know, we ask the same questions then within the church today and the role of the Psalms. Now we have to move on. In addition to the Holy Hodeot, there's certainly other collections of Psalms. We have a whole lovely collection of Psalms, again, very fragmentary, much of this is fragmentary, attributed to kings, the prayer of Manasseh, prayer of, we have a lovely song, this is the text I worked in. It says prayer of, and then the mouse ate the next word, and then it's king of Judah. So the mouse often seems to get the key word. So one of the kings of Judah. Prayer of Obadiah. We have a whole collection of Psalms. Baki Nafsi, bless the Lord, O my soul, modeled on Psalm 103 and 104. So these are not so distinctively sectarian. They don't have the vocabulary, the worldview, the theology of this particular Essene group. So again, it's showing it's not only sectarian groups, but probably much more what we would call common Judaism. They were also writing and using psalms that went beyond the biblical 150. But I want to say something now about the biblical, the copies of the biblical Psalter that were found at Qumran. And as with all our biblical manuscripts, these are our earliest copies of the Psalms, over a thousand years earlier than the Leningrad Codex that we, most of our Bibles are translated from, from around 1000 to 1009. These are very important for textual criticism. They have influenced translations, the NRSV, the NAB, the, the, both the original and the revised edition. If you look at your notes, you'll often see in Bibles then a little note where a reading has been taken from one of the Qumran manuscripts. But what I want to look for at a minute, as a, for a minute is what I said before, that the number of psalms is distinctive. The number of psalm manuscripts. Any handbook on the scrolls is going to emphasize that we have, usually the number is given 34, 36 copies of the Psalter. That's more than of any other biblical book. About 30 copies of Deuteronomy, 21 copies of Isaiah. And then you think a book like Jeremiah or Ezekiel, we have six copies, four copies of Samuel and Kings. So it's often been said that the Psalter, Deuteronomy, and Isaiah seem to be the most popular, the most authoritative book within this community, books within this community. And those of you New Testament scholars, probably recognize that it's often said that the book Psalter, Deuteronomy, and Isaiah are the books quoted most frequently in the New Testament. But the evidence is a little more complex. 
I mean, I said the Psalter manuscripts are very badly preserved. Often we only have a very small fragment, a couple of words in that. We can recognize what psalm it is. And probably many of these manuscripts did not contain all 150 psalms. There's good evidence that some of them contained smaller collections. A, some of the, a couple of these manuscripts might have only contained Psalm 119. You know how long that one is. So there are different ways of writing these psalms and putting them together. What is especially valuable is where we have the trans transition from one psalm to another. And then we can often see that the psalms were not in the same order as in our Psalter. So in some of the best preserved manuscripts, the large psalm manuscript from Cave 11, for instance, not only is the order of the psalms different, but 10 other psalms are included, mixed in with the biblical 150. A psalm about Zion, a plea for deliverance, that Psalm 151 about David, a psalm about wisdom that shows up also in the book of Ben Sirah. So the implications of this are, have been and are still very much debated. We probably don't have 36 Psalters. And it's, indeed, it's not clear how fixed or set was the collection. It seems the first 100 Psalms by this time were much more clearly fixed. The last 50, a considerable variation. And the different versions of the psalms that were circulating probably bespeak different theological emphases. Just one example. You know, in our Psalter, we read, we have the long Psalm 119, this great psalm in, in praise of law and Torah. And then it's 119, then you go to Psalms 120 to 123. 30, uh, 120 to 132 or 33, the Psalms of Ascent, let us go up to the house of the Lord. But in one arrangement at Qumran, the order is the opposite. You have the Psalms of Ascent, you go up, and then you have Psalm 119. So you're going up to Torah. And so this bespeaks then a certain emphasis that was, at least in many aspects of Judaism this, at this time, that the climax of revelation was seen in law and in wisdom. So again, there's many questions here, but we can ask these questions now in a new way because we have this material. And perhaps some of these different manuscripts shouldn't be called Psalters at all, but are much more what we would call a prayer book. You know, when we, we sometimes will put together some psalms, some more devotional prayers, and so that might be speaking something about how these psalms were being used at this time. Because the question of how the psalms were used, especially apart <coughs> from the temple, is very interesting. You know, how much were they being used for personal prayer, meditation? You know, I said there's some of these small psalters that point maybe to this. It's interesting, it's hard to find any evidence that the psalms were recited within the synagogue. You know, the synagogue, of course, was just developing in the first century. And it was a place for the community to gather to read Torah, to expound on Torah. I mean, if you think of Luke 4, when Jesus goes into the synagogue at Nazareth, or Paul when he goes into the synagogues in the diaspora, very little mention of singing psalms or even reciting prayers at all. And it wasn't really till the fourth or fifth century that there's clear evidence of psalms coming into the synagogue liturgy. And so this is some interesting implications for how we reconstruct the development of Christian liturgy, especially the development of the liturgy of the word. I mean, sometimes it's assumed it was just taken over automatically from the synagogue. Don't think it was quite that simple. 
But the one thing that we do have, some evidence, is that the Psalms were being read very much as prophecy was read. And we have this series of texts from Qumran that we call the Pesharim, the commentaries, especially on the prophetic books. We have a Pesher on Isaiah, on Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. These are really our first commentaries where they quote a biblical verse and then they explain how it is to be interpreted. And all of this is based on the understanding that a prophet, like Habakkuk, for instance, was not only talking about his own day, the 6th century BC, the time of the Babylonians, but that the, there was a meaning of his words, that the real full meaning of his words were for this community, and that God had revealed to their founder, the so-called teacher of righteousness, all the mysteries that were hidden in the prophets, and they had the key to interpret it. So you can look on your text there, and under number three, just I gave it just a very small example. Example. What is interesting is that you don't have psalms only on the uh, Pesharim, only on the prophets, but also on the psalms. And so here you have a commentary on Psalm 37. This biblical verse, the steps of a man are confirmed by the Lord and he delights in all his ways, and then an interpretation. Who is this referring? This in, in concerns the priest, the teacher of righteousness, whom God chose to stand before him, for he established him to build for himself the congregation of, and then it breaks off. So this way of understanding the Psalms and reading them, much as the way that you read the prophetic books, was part of this community, and of course it resonates with the early Christian community. You think of Peter in Acts 2 on Pentecost, where he quotes the prophet Joel, and then he also quotes Psalm 16 and Psalm 110. For David said confirming, concerning him, for seeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. And this is, of course, how the Liturgy of the Hours in the Christian tradition often uses the Psalms, particularly in the prayer after the Psalms, making explicit then this link of seeing Christ in the Psalms, as we often use the phrase. But this was very much part of Second Temple Judaism. Okay, so just let's move on to the final, the last collection of set prayers on the back of your sheet. I said, one of the things that we found in the scrolls were these collections of prayers for days of the week, days of the month, for festivals. So this tells us that at least among certain groups of Jews, the practice of having set, or the word in Jewish liturgy, statutory prayers, was beginning to develop prior to the destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70. So this did not only happen after the destruction to replace sacrifice, but along with the temple and sacrificial worship. Now, certainly probably this had a particular emphasis among this group of Essenes who were very ambivalent, to put it mildly, toward the temple. They could be very harsh in their condemnation of the temple. They thought the sacrifices weren't being done in the right way. The correct regulations weren't being followed. And they developed a life of prayer and righteous living, a disciplined way of life that could substitute for sacrifice. Just one quote from one of the rules of the community. They come together in order to atone for the guilt of iniquity and the unfaithfulness of sin without the flesh of burnt offering and without the fat of sacrifice. The offering of the lips in compliance with the degree will be like the pleasant aroma of justice and perfectedness of behavior will be acceptable as a free will offering. If you know the, this language, and especially if you read it in Hebrew, these are all the words from Leviticus. This is priestly language now being applied to prayer. 
So for this group, that's quite clear, but it's more complicated again, because the first example you hear, have here, what I call the prayers for the day of the week, 4Q504, these manuscripts are all numbered, is one of the oldest scrolls that we have at Qumran. It's actually written, the handwriting we can date, probably going back as far as 175 BC, before this, complete, this particular community, we think, was even formed. So it seems to indicate that there were at least some pietistic groups developing prayers based on a weekly cycle. And we have other cycles, the next one on your sheet there, the prayers for each day of the month, morning and evening, are based very much on the cycle of the, of the rising and the setting of the sun, the cycle of nature as determining the way of prayers. The other thing that I want to emphasize is that these prayers were beginning to take on specific forms and structure. It wasn't yet fully developed and fixed, but if you look there, I emphasize, notice how many of these either start or end or both with this blessing formula. Baruch, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. Blessed be, the, blessed be you, the God of Israel. Later, the form with you where you address God directly became standard in rabbinic prayer. But here, there's quite a bit of variation. So again, this structure, formulating prayers in terms of blessings, we now know goes back second century BC at least, which we had no evidence for before. The one other thing that's very interesting, if you go to the third prayer there, when you come to the prayer for Shabbat, it has a completely different uh, formula. The rubric says at the beginning, the song of praises for the day of Shabbat, praise the Lord forever, bless the name of his holiness, proclaim his praises with the angels and the whole of the heavens, the cosmic world, give thanks to the Lord, bless the name of his holiness, sing to the Lord. Notice it's entirely a prayer of praise. And again, that's part of the Siddur today. On the Shabbat, you only say words of praise. And again, we had no way of knowing when that began or how early it is. Now we know that it goes back to the Second Temple period. And I think it's very interesting when we have the stories of Jesus healing on the Sabbath. It's not just a dispute over the nature of work. It's a nat you know, what brings healing and praise on Shabbat. So I think there's a lot of things we could think about there. I'm just going to give one more example about how these new prayers, how these prayers were formulated that is interesting and helpful to us. And the last one, number five there, or addressing God in prayer. This is just a small text, but it's one I worked on. I tended to chose examples that I'd actually edited here. But it's a prayer that comes from a composition. We don't really know what it is, so it has the innocuous name, narrative and prose composition. But it's a prayer of Joseph. It's probably the tribe of Joseph. And it's, Joseph is lamenting for all of this. Joseph was put into the hands of strangers to consume his strength and break his bones until the end of time. He cried to the mighty God that he should save him from their hands. And he said, my father and my God, do not abandon me to the hands of the nations. Notice how he just addresses God, Avi, my father. Aviva Ali. So the image of God of Father, of course, we know from the Old Testament, but to address God as Father in prayer. It's not examples of that. Might be one example in Ben Sirah. And now we have it in a text from the first century. It's not frequent. There's another prayer from a similar text where it ends, my Father and my Lord. But these texts, again, indicate that there was a Jewish precedence for addressing God as Father, as we find it in the Our Father, in the prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane, in Paul's encouragement to call, for the early Christians to call on God as Abba, as Father. Now, I'm going to just one last point, and then I'll draw it to a close. I do want to think, to help us think, 
that when we think about prayer in the Bible, we often turn, of course, to the Psalter, and rightly so, but there are over a hundred prayers of individuals in a narrative context. And I think those are worth, you know, there's much, often we just sort of overlook at them. Some of them are very short. Some of them are much more developed and, liter and literary styled. Um, you know, we're going to talk about Mi Miriam in a moment, but when you think about the story of Miriam in Numbers chapter 12, when she's struck with leprosy, Moses prays, Oh God, please heal her. It's about the shortest prayer you can get. With this very direct address of petition. But then you also have examples like after the golden calf incident, where Moses intercedes for the people in a much longer, more developed prayer. Sometimes you have a poetic text put on the mouth of an individual. Think of the song of Hannah, or in the book of Jonah. You know, what's appropriate for Jonah to say when he's sitting in the bowels of the whale? He says this biblical psalm of thanksgiving. So this tendency to put prayers and psalms in the mouth of leading figures is certainly expanded in the later books of the Old Testament, the Deuterocanonical books, we might call them. Some of the most beautiful prayers are in Tobit, in Judith, the Greek additions to the book of Esther. Now, this interest in the prayers of leading figures continues in a whole genre of literature that was developing in which you retold the biblical narrative. And again, much of this we know only from the scrolls. But what were you interested as you were retelling the story? Often it was you supplied the prayers that you thought the biblical figure might have said that was part of them this ongoing tradition. So the example I have here is from the Genesis Apocryphon, which is a book that we only know from the Dead Sea Scrolls, where it's retelling in Aramaic, in, not in Hebrew, but in Aramaic, the story of Abraham. And this is Abraham and Sarah when they're taken into Egypt and Sarah is taken by the Pharaoh. Sarah had been taken away from me by force, Abraham is saying. That night I prayed, I pleaded in my distress while my tears flowed. And then you have his prayer. And notice how it's formulated. Blessed are you, O Lord God, most high, my Lord for all ages, for you are the Lord and master of everything. Do justice for me. So we have many examples. I'm going to close with just one last one. And that's from Exodus 15. That we've talked about a couple of times over the last two days then, the whole story of coming out of Egypt, which culminates then in the Song of Moses in Exodus 15. And after you have this long poetic text, then you have the verses, then the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them. And then you quote the first line from Moses' song, sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously, horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. But what's interesting is there's one manuscript at Qumran, very fragmentary, but it's enough preserved show, to show that after this verse from Exodus, Miriam's prayer is expanded. And you can see on your sheet there, the beginnings of seven lines that are quite different, that continue this praise, this God casting down the remedies and raising up the lowly. Now, there's been a long debate among scholars about the nature of this scroll. Is it like the Genesis Apocryphon, an expansion, a paraphrase of the book of Exodus? Or, and I think this is becoming the standard opinion, it's really a different version of the book of Exodus a text of Exodus where Moses is given prominence. <coughs> She's not just repeating the song of Moses, but has, where Miriam is given prominence. She's not just repeating the song of Moses, but has her own song. And in either case, it points to an interest in Miriam as a prayer, as a singer of victory songs. 
So I'm going to leave you with this last thought, is how, how much were women composers and prayers of biblical psalms and prayers? And I draw your attention when you get your copy of the uh, Paulus Biblical Commentary. Look at how Andres and Prince treated this question. They reflected on it and adopted a unique approach. They say, when the language of the psalm is singular and the subject could be either masculine or feminine, this commentary reads as if the speaker of one psalm is female and the next is male. So when you know, you're reading the commentary on one psalm, it'll say, he said, he said, and then you read the next psalm and it'll say, she said. They're not claiming that there's evidence that the speaker of such and such a psalm was female, but they are experimenting. They're asking, will this approach assist contemporary hearers to think in terms of men and women praying these psalms? You can see what you think as you use the commentary. So I hope this has been helpful a little bit in thinking about the biblical psalms and prayers in a somewhat different way and providing some context for our understanding and further study of this material. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Eileen. Um, I really enjoyed and appreciated that. It's a great privilege to be able to hear about uh, prayer uh, at Qumran from someone who knows it so thoroughly and so well, and an even greater honor uh, to be able to say a few words in response. It's a really a beautiful uh, illustration of just how important and relevant the discoveries of Qumran are uh, for the study of the Bible and, and even our life in the church today. I wish all of my students could have heard that so that they can actually see what I mean when I tell them that Qumran is important. Um, a couple days ago, after you uh, so generously uh, shared a copy of your, your text with me and I'd had a chance to look at it uh, briefly, I was talking to a friend of mine and told him that I had to respond to a paper um, on uh, prayer at Qumran. And he kind of chuckled and he said, Whenever I hear that word Qumran, I think of that song by Bon Iver. Now, I know you've spent your whole life studying Qumran. I don't know if you've had the time or the interest uh, to collect uh, cultural references to Qumran, but this is a good one. Um, this song, it's called Regarding Stacks. Uh, it's actually about breaking up with a girl. Uh, but the, the lead singer of this band, Justin Vernon, did a degree in religious studies at University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. And uh, he, he does something very strange with Qumran in here. He makes it a metaphor for discontinuity, for rupture and radical change. And I thought of that uh, in particular in light of your talk, just how you did something completely different, that you showed how continuous uh, the life of, of, of prayer at Qumran and in Second Temple Judaism is with the life of the church today and with all of the Bible. You showed us how the Qumran community really treasured the Psalms. And this is reflected in the remarkable number of manuscripts that were discovered. I was particularly struck, though, by the existence of these little pocket editions, both of the Psalms and of the Hodayot. Um, and, and it was beautiful as well the way that you characterized the interpretation of the Psalms in the Pesherim, saying that it was an effort to find the real and full meaning of those words for that community, not as ancient texts from the sixth century, but as, as words that spoke to that community. And you pointed out that this is something that, that the New Testament does and that we do in the church and in, in the Liturgy of the Hours, uh, consciously attempting uh, to interpret the, songs, uh, the Psalms for our own community, and in particular to apply them to Christ. I think of St. Luke's uh, distinctive formulation in that masterful story of Emmaus, which is all about how Christ fulfills the scriptures, where he actually has Jesus say specifically, everything written about me in the law of Moses, the Torah, and the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. But more broadly, uh, it was beautiful to hear that today because this task of finding the real and full meaning of the scriptures for our community 
is something that we aspire to do as Catholic biblical scholars. And this occasion of the launch of the uh, Paulist biblical commentary really highlights that with its, uh, with its pastoral objectives, not just to be an instrument for scholars, but for, for ministers and those that apply this word to our own context. Hearing of this love for the Psalms that led them to be copied, carried around, meditated upon, and interpreted can't help but make me wish for such a reception of the Psalms today. If I could just give a little personal story about that. I grew up Catholic, went to Catholic schools, went to Mass a lot all the time. But I think the first time that I really heard or prayed a psalm was not until my senior year here at Boston College when I visited the Jesuit novitiate. And uh, there, for the first time in my life, I prayed the Liturgy of the Hours with them. And it was praying a psalm all the way through. I don't think I had ever actually done that before. You know, my experience, like most Catholics, of the psalms was the responsorial psalm at Mass, where I'm always focused on remembering my line and not listening to anything else, and usually forgetting it um, as well. Um, and so being able to hear those psalms was really transformative for me, and it, it made me realize uh, the truth of what you said about how the psalms really formed and shaped a people and a community. And it, it, wrote, you know, it awakened to me a desire for uh, the church to be able to, to pray and live the psalms in that way. And Luke Timothy Johnson actually anticipated me in saying this last night, especially with his, his, his final comment there um, of, of advice that, that we need to pray the psalms in, together and out loud. And what a, what a beautiful opportunity. I mean, uh, it would be if we could somehow do that better in the context of our liturgy where... Uh, as it has been said, most of us encounter scripture. Now, you also pointed out that the love and respect shown for the Psalms at Qumran um, didn't restrict, but actually prompted the creative generation of new prayerful and poetic texts modeled on them. The Hodayot, these fixed prayers, uh, the prayers and the retellings of the biblical narratives. It's striking that we see the New Testament doing exactly the same thing in composing canticles and hymns that are very psalm-like in their structure, such as in the Gospel of Luke, parts of Paul, uh, the book of Revelation. If we think of Luke as a rewritten gospel, um, it, rewriting his sources and particularly Mark, you see that one of the things that he actually does is exactly that. Insert hymns, canticles of praise, the three great canticles in his, um, in his infancy narrative. And of course, Christians have continued to do this, to write poetic and prayerful texts, but I had never thought of it before as being something like writing new psalms and expanding on them. And some of these uh, prayerful and poetic texts in the life of the church have become kind of canonical in their own way. Uh, hymns and prayers like the Vene Creator Spiritus, the Pange Lingua, Amazing Grace, or more modernly and a personal favorite, O oh God Beyond All Praising, which seems to be obligatory at the end of ordinations now. Um, your discussion of how the composition of these texts, such as the Hodayot, Fixed Prayers, Biblical Retelling genre at Qumran, uh, give us a background for how far back this goes and, and what a deep tradition it really is. And your description of this helped me to appreciate the role that these prayers texts play in the New Testament, as analogous to Psalms and worthy to be esteemed as such, help me see why in the morning prayer we insert, uh, I, I'm sorry, in evening prayer, we always have one of these at, at, uh, in, in the place of the third Psalm, um, as well as the importance of such compositions in the life of the church today. They may not be sacred scripture, but they are nonetheless um, uh, connected to it and worthy of our reverence. And so to sum up now and, and point to a, a couple of general directions for questions, uh, you showed us how Qumran provided a, a background in which to understand prayer in the Bible and the church, that there is a continuous development, a con continuity uh, between uh, the Bible, the New Testament, the church, and uh, what, these, um, what these believers at Qumran did and how they prayed and worshiped God. And the Psalms had a primary place of importance, not just as historical texts, but texts to be read and applied to the community and serve as models and inspirations for other prayerful texts. The New Testament does the same thing, and so does the church. So my question is just to sort of bring this then into the Bible and the life of the church. Um, and just ask you, sister, 
which examples of these two activities, interpreting the Psalms and composing new texts, would you find most compelling, uh, both in, in the New Testament and in the life of the church? So thank you, sister. I'm not sure if I really have a great deal to add to that. Um, I mean, yes, I think that was a wonderful response in sort of highlighting some of the things that I thought were really important. I was very struck last night by how Luke Johnson was saying very much the same type of things. Um, I mean, I think that, that the, the balance is we're also, and you know, perhaps this has been behind a lot of our discussion in the last few days, how do we deal with these questions when we're dealing with a generation and with people who this is not part of their tradition. I mean, we, I think here we're, we're looking in, you know, even at the Qumran community, with people who were probably steeped in scripture and in the Psalms. And this is not the world that we have today. And so I think, I don't have an answer for that, but I, have, I think we have to be aware of it. Some of it is, you know, well, we have to begin somewhere. And perhaps, you know, beginning with very, as I think Luke was said, saying last night, we can think of very small beginnings. I, as I said, I taught for uh, seven years in an ecumenical seminary where we, a very unique experience, unfortunately was brought to an end, but of training Catholic, Anglican, and United Church of Canada, which is our main Protestant denomination, in a single school. And one of the things that I learned there by experience, because it was so much of the Protestant Methodist tradition, is that you always began with a psalm or a reading of scripture. I mean, it might, sometimes it was done rather superficially, but it was part, you know, you'd have a picnic, you'd have an, uh, an event, but there was always a moment, let's have a moment of prayer first. And that's not part of our tradition in the same way. And I also think, you know, the, even the, you know, the common things, it's by maybe choosing a small group of psalms that we repeat over and over when parish council meets, when the business committee meets, you know, that people will become used to these words in a way that we don't have. But I think it is a real question. Maybe you have better answers. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I, uh, I mean, I, I, I do think that the key is to get people to pray the Psalms. And uh, in light of the fact that, that Mass is, in fact, where... Uh, where most Catholics primarily encounter scripture and, and pray together, I think revitalizing our way of, of doing that would be wonderful. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was at a wedding, um, and uh, five minutes before mass started, the musicians, who were not professionals but friends of the family, uh, came into the sacristy in a panic because they had not prepared the responsorial psalm. And uh, I had other things to worry about, and so I said, could you just find who's doing the first reading and ask her to do it? Well, it turned out that the person who in the first reading didn't know how to do the responsorial psalm, and so she just pulled, she had seen the psalm number in her, in the program, she just pulled it out on her phone and read it all the way through. And it was, I don't remember which psalm it was, it was a long psalm. And of course, all of the Catholics who knew better were kind of tut-tutting, uh, but I actually thought it worked a lot better um, as a way of actually hearing the psalms. And I think we could even teach congregations how to do that antiphonally. Um, in a week or two, and actually be able to pray psalms in their entirety um, as a community, much like what Luke Johnson said, pray it together out loud, not in small groups, but as a church gathered for worship. Well, thank you to both Eileen and Matt. Let's see if there's any uh, questions from, or comments from our distinguished audience here, and I'll try to look around the podium, so <laughs> I do have a blind spot, more than I care to admit. <laughs> Thank you so much for both the, the, the talk and the response. Um, I was deeply moved when you talked about how in the first century they used a 
the Psalms as a ritual way to replace the ritual of sacrifice and that that was happening, I'm like quivering when I think about this, right on the heels of Jesus whose very life and death and resurrection was all about no more of this sacrifice. And it brought me to, and, and the fact that we're having this repeating theme of using the Psalms as a way of healing and it brought me to this place where we are so desperately in need of healing. And wh how can we use the Psalms uh, and scripture and all those other wonderful individual prayers as a way of healing what we as modern individuals have used in a sacrificial way in terms of the church and the sexual abuse crisis, the way that women are treated uh, in the church and uh, and, not, and outside the church, the way that our country treats immigrants and LGBTQ and on and on and on. I mean, yes, you've said really. I think, again, you know, the looking at the Psalter as a whole, and, you know, there's been so much work done on the importance of the lament psalms and the importance of voicing some of the very harsh and, and difficult language in that. But also, um, those are often the psalms that are not used, and particularly in public settings. And, you know, again, rightly so, we're dealing with very often simply the responsorial psalm, but uh, which tends to be a psalm of praise. But the rich, and actually in the Psalter, numerically, the largest number of psalms are psalms of lament. And I think those are often the psalms that we don't know. I mean, sometimes because they can also be very, very harsh, very harsh against enemies and things like that. But there is still something that that language of voicing lament and giving the sense that that is also part of the life of individuals and the life of the community is something I think we're still struggling with. <coughs> Thank you for bringing that up. Any other, any, John, wait for, the, wait for the microphone, John. Yes. <coughs> yeah, I want to thank you for focusing on the Psalms. I love the Psalms, and they're wonderful to pray. But I wondered if you could address a couple questions. Um, in what sense were the Psalms seen as a, you mentioned it was prophetic. Many times the Psalms were used as, as a prophetic way. What way were the Psalms seem, uh, seemed as a corrective to the Christian community? And then the other question I have was whether you study at Qumran or you study the Psalms, is there a theme of things that were excluded from the prayer life of the early Christian community? Uh, for example, there's been a recurrent theme that Deuteronomy, the Psalms, and Isaiah is, is talked about in the prayer life. But why were other texts like the Exodus or Proverbs or wisdom literature couldn't, excluded from the, the focus of the prayer life of the church? Maybe that's more for you if it's New Testament. Um. What was the last part of that question again? I'm sorry. The question was, Yeah, that's a that's an interesting um, characterization of it. I uh, I'm not I, yeah I I don't know if I would be able to explain sort of the absence of things so much as why it was that Isaiah and the Psalms and Deuteronomy you know were so relevant. And what what's interesting is the overlap that we see between the citations you know, broadly speaking in the New Testament being applied to Christ and what they seem to be most interested in at Qumran, um, that these were texts that were uh, um, important in the, you know, in this era of, of Second Temple Judaism, and those were the texts that Christians went to to reread in light of what they had learned uh, um, in Christ. 
Uh, and um, yeah, so I'm not sure so much if there was any sort of desire to exclude, so much as is that that was where their attention went. <laughs> I'm not sure, corrective to what? Corrective to other tendencies within the religious um, I don't know, Sister, within yeah, Qumran, would you I don't, Yeah, I don't know if we have the evidence to answer that. Um, I mean, one of the things that comes to my mind, too, is that when especially, and I'm not an expert in this, but when we move to the early Christian traditions, the monastic tradition, you know, was often the tradition of the Psalms, simply the recitations of the Psalms as a way of discipline and a focus. And that's a use that's even very different than our own contemporary use of them in the Liturgy of the Hours. Simply the recitation of the Psalms in order. I mean, and this was a big dispute in monastic, you know, was it better to recite the whole Psalter every day or was once a week enough? And how much was this just part of discipline? The other thing that you know comes to mind, I don't know again what to say about it, but one of the things that has struck me about the use of the Psalms in the Jewish tradition, in contemporary life, is that they have a tradition of what they call simply reading Psalms that we don't have. And where this really struck me is I've lived for a number of years at different times in my life in Jerusalem. And at the time of disaster, I was there particularly 95 and 96 when the bus bombings were so common and they were on routes that I would take. But when you'd have an a absolutely tragic bus bombing, pe ordinary people would come for hours and hours and stand and read their book of Psalms. That was a phenomenon I had never seen before. But it also said something. It was a, an incorporation into the community. It was drawing upon a traditional text. It wasn't just the words, were these applicable to the situation. There was something about reading the corpus at a time of communal disaster. And I don't quite know what to do with that. But again, I think it's part of a tradition and looking to the very different ways that Psalms have been used in the tradition. Dick has a question. <clears throat> Thank you for your talk. Uh, Eileen, you intrigued me at the beginning when you said that uh, there were secret, the, the word secret council and mystery uh, used in some of those prayers. And I wonder if uh, you have any insights about what they meant. And the reason I ask it is because in the New Testament, mystery has a particular meaning. And I wonder if there's a kind of anticipation of some future intervention of God in those psalms of praise. Uh, but what you're, there's a couple of uh, something or other they, yes, uh, the, in the, uh, in the yeah. Qumran, recently uh, published Qumran scrolls. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about what that might mean. No, certainly it's part of the view of this group of, of people that, I mean, one of the things I think is that's hard for us to understand, particularly with this group of Qum, that we have at Qumran or the Essenes, is in a certain sense to join this group, and particularly if it meant withdrawing somewhat from the temple sacrifices, which was the way prescribed in Torah, I mean, this was the word of God for how you make atonement to God, how you became one with God. This community is saying, no, at least in the present reality, we have a different way. There's something then wrong with what's going on at present. And through our teacher, we have a sense of a different type of knowledge, these some insight into the mystery of God's plan, which is what this language of mystery and the counsel of truth, and that is that we have, through our teacher, we have this insight. And so to join this community was also a spiritual risk. You were cutting yourself off 
from what had been the normative way of making atonement of one with God. So I think that part of what these psalms are doing then is repeating over and over and forming the people then into this way of saying, well, this way is what we believe is the correct way to God through prayer and, and righteous living rather than sacrifice. But I'm not quite sure. I mean, it's, it's never that the content of this mystery is spelled out. But the sense that there is an ongoing revelation of which we're, we are a part. We claim to be a part. And how do you initiate people into that type of worldview? Which I think in our world, I mean, we're, the Christian message is also, at least in our society, as radical. And the decision to say, well, this is going to be my worldview, rather than what, what my, my society tells me is the value of life and the value of the human person. It takes a radical decision. And somehow we're enter, we enter, we shaped into that worldview through these types of texts. That's all I can say. I think we have time for one more question. So then you want the last word. Enrique. Thank you, Eileen, uh, for your presentation. I like it very much, and also for your passion that you put in, in, in your presentation. Uh, you pointed out how the Book of Psalms is uh, the most copied text in Qumran. Well, uh, in the New Testament, it's the same way. Uh, it is the most quoted book. About one-third of the quotations in the New Testament concern the Book of Psalms, so that... Uh, 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 importance is reflected in, in, in among Christians. Well, I will I will have just uh, uh, one question. If you want to say something about this, uh, it seems to me that in the Psalms in Qumran, there is a lot of attention on the figure of David, hmm? uh, Psalms of David, the the person of David, Messianic uh, Davidic uh, Psalms. Uh, but it seems to me that, uh, well, there was an expectation of the Messiah of our own and the Messiah of Israel. But if I'm wrong, I am not wrong, the focus was more on the Messiah of our own. Uh, how to combine these? On the one side, we see this um, uh, attention to Davidic Psalms. But on the other hand, we have in that community, uh, like uh, uh, giving more importance to the role of the priest, if you want to add something, maybe I am wrong. Yes. I mean, again, it's, and it's hard to know exactly from the Psalms. Uh, certainly the role of the priest, and I, I, maybe I can even correct what I was maybe leaving the impression before. The role of the temple within this community and the whole priestly system of sacrifice was very important. It might, there was tremendous critique of the present situation. But I think it's very interesting that in the scroll that looks much more to the end of days, the war scroll, in this final war scroll when there's going to be, and again, it's this imagery of a great battle, when the sons of light will finally have victory over the sons of darkness, the first thing that they do is to restore the temple in Jerusalem and do the sacrifices in the right way. So this is not an anti-temple or anti-sacrifice uh, way of thinking. And again, because this is part of the Torah of Moses. So yes, there's both there. Thank you. Well, please join me in thanking uh, Eileen for a great presentation. <laughs>